Hello, everybody. Hopefully, you can hear me. Uh, my name is Fran Delic. I'm a first year PhD student at uh, PhD student at the University of uh, University of Cambridge Department of Physics. And today, I'll be talking about numerical modeling of cavitation erosion using a poly dispersed fluid formulation. So firstly, I'll, I'll briefly go uh, about the motivation and goals of uh, the thesis. Then I will talk about the bulk fluid description, highlighting the governing equations, closure models, and validation. And I will speak about uh, cavitation erosion models, which are both macroscopic and mesoscopic. And lastly, I will give a conclusion and some ideas for future work. So start. Hopefully you can still hear me. Uh, speaking about uh, cavitation, all liquids contain uh, millions of small bubble nuclei in the order of 10 to the 12th uh, of nuclei per meter cube. cube uh, pressure changes in the bulk fluid induce bubble collapses, which uh, sometimes result in surface erosion. Uh, the collapse of a bubble uh, has vastly different spatial and temporal scales uh, than the bulk flow. A collapse of a bubble is uh, an event in the order of uh, milliseconds and millimeters, while uh, cavitation erosion is on the scale of centimeters to meters and on a temporal scale, scale of hours to days. Uh, because of that, uh, separation of scales, uh, scales is used to separate the modeling into two parts. Uh, modeling of the bulk fluid and modeling of uh, the bubble collapse or a more general erosion model. In the end, the goal is to derive a more accurate cavitation erosion model, uh, which is applicable to complex flows and applicable to fluids with wide range of physical properties, uh, which is especially re relevant since this project is funded by Afton Chem Chemical, which uh, is a manufacturer of lubricants or additives to lubricants. Okay, so briefly uh, speaking about uh, the events of bubble collapses, uh, here we can see a spherical bubble. Uh, oh, I'm going to use my mouse. Great. Uh, this is a bubble which is uh, being uh, objected to two pressures, uh, one below and one, one above critical pressure. Uh, this is the expression to derive the critical pressure for a bubble with a certain surface tension, uh, mass, poly polytropic gas constant, and temperature. Uh, here we can see if uh, uh, pressure drops below the, cr uh, the critical pressure, the radius of the bubble uh, increases greatly and oscillates, and oscillates uh, resulting in high pressure waves. This is one of the mechanisms uh, of induction of pressure waves, which can be uh, roughly approximated to 100 times the maximum radi radius of the bubble times the pressure of the undisturbed field uh, divided by the distance uh, from the point at which we are measuring the pressure. Another, another collapse which we are interested in is a non-spherical bubble collapse, which occurs uh, near walls. Uh, here we can see a snapshot of how this bubble looks. So the bubble expands, and due to the non-symmetry and pressure between the wall at the bottom and the uh, bulk fluid at the top, uh, the top surface deforms, touches the bottom surface, and causes a microjet, which goes in this direction. The velocity of the microjet can be approximated by uh, the expression highlighted here, uh, which has a constant which is in the order of 1 to approximately 20, depending on the uh, research conducted. Uh, this velocity causes a uh, water hammer pressure uh, shown here, and depending on the distance of the bubble from the wall, or more spe specifically the ratio of the bubble diameter to the bubble distance, it creates uh, different parameters or different damage patterns. Uh, here we can see primarily so these, these are three standard distances of bubble. Uh, this is a, a standard distance of 0 0.8, 1.8. 1 and 1.3. Uh, these two are probably best to highlight different modes of uh, cavitation erosion. This is a cavitation erosion which is primarily caused by uh, the damage from the microjet, which is, is very concentrated in the middle. 
And here you can see the cavitation erosion, uh, which is caused by the collapse of the uh, spherical bubble, not a spherical bubble, but a donut shaped bubble, which remains, which uh, creates a more circular pattern. So the conclusion is to model uh, cavitation erosion properly, we need to take into account both uh, the modes of damage and the bulk fluid model should provide the fluid pressure, the bubble number, the bubble diameter and the bubble distance to wall to be able to accurately compute uh, the pressures that are, that are uh, seen. Uh, on the graph at the right, you can see the pressure distribution across the collapse event. And here you can see two different peak pressures, let's say. This is a peak, peak pressure due to jet impact. So this one the, here. Oops. And this is a uh, peak pressure due to the bubble ring collapse uh, seen here. So because of that, we can describe the fluid in two main descriptions, an Eulerian Lagrangian description. Uh, however, this is not applicable because, again, we have millions of bubbles. Uh, so it just wouldn't be feasible to do it. Uh, Another option is a hybrid Euler Lagrange approach, which has been used by uh, the research groups at Chalmers and Dynaflow, which uses a Eulerian to Lagrangian and Lagrangian to Eulerian uh, transformation algorithm to, to be able to describe both uh, frameworks. However, for uh, realistic industrial scale simulations, an Euler, Euler description is preferred. Uh, most models uh, dealing with cavitation erosions, uh, erosion use a monodispersed description. However, a polydispersed is, uh, description is something that we're looking into just to be able to provide a more accurate uh, description of the actual bubble diameter. Again, two options are present here, a population balance equation uh, or a, let's say, subset of the population balance equation called the method of classes or the multifluid uh, description which in which uh, the continuous and an arbitrary number of bubble phases form the uh, bulk fluid. I will just briefly go uh, over some of the equations here. Uh, these are condition uh, condition volume average governing equations. So firstly, we take incompressible an incompressible Newtonian fluid. We assume the the pressure is shared across all the phases we condition it using a volume of fluid approach we we volume average it and we get these three equations here a uh, continuity equation with a shared velocity not a shared velocity but a uh, average velocity weight of velocity a phase fraction equation here which has an uh, implicit coupling present at the third term at the, red, uh, the left hand side and a momentum exchange uh, 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 linear momentum conservation equation at the bottom. Again, we have three terms that uh, we need to model here. Uh, the momentum exchange term, the mass exchange term, and Reynolds, or more, to, more accurately, combined uh, stresses. Momentum tra tra transfer is considered only between the continuous and dispersed phases, uh, which is a two-way coupling uh, shown here. A drag model by Ruscha is used, a virtual mass coefficient is assumed to be 0 0.5. Uh, the lift coefficient is calculated using uh, Tomiyama's model, and uh, the turbulence dispersion model is based on the Favre averaged uh, dispersion. A Bosonesque eddy equation, uh, eddy viscosity is used to, uh, to close the Reynolds stresses. Again, a modified uh, chi epsilon turbulence model by Ruscha is used here with two additional equations. And not implemented yet uh, are the multifluid mass transfer by Battistoni et al. and the bubble breakup and coalescence model by uh, Lou and Svensson. And finally, we get to some actual results. This is a bubbly column uh, in a vertical square duct by Roy et al. The code uh, which I use to solve this is based on a dense spray code by Kesser. It has no coalescence and no breakup. Uh, convergence is checked on three grids and the the results that i will show are uh, the same for an arbitrary number number of bubble phases which is something that we are looking for these are uh, results for the x velocity of the continuous phase where the dots represent experimental results 
and uh, the uh, lines, the blue, black, and uh, red line represents three uh, grids of varying uh, mesh densities. Again, results show good convergence to experimental results for across the board at, at different distances from the inlet. Uh, these results are the phase fraction of the dispersed phase. The results show good convergence to experimental data. However, there is an overestimation of the phase fraction near the inlet, uh, which is something that I will definitely look into it uh, into. I believe this is due to the lift model. Uh, however, this is a part of the future work that I need to examine further. Great, so now that we have a model for the bulk flow, I will briefly speak about erosion models. Uh, here I divided the erosion models into two scales, let's say. Uh, firstly, they, we have macroscopic models which examine the bulk flow uh, for two criterion. So we take a face, uh, we examine each face and a subset of cells around that face to make sure that there is, uh, there is vapor present within uh, the hemisphere, which is called the, uh, the vapor criterion and that the pressures are such that uh, the vapor or the bubbles in there can cause damage. Uh, two common models uh, are implemented, a microjet model by uh, Dular uh, and a bubble collapse model by Frank. Another option are so-called mesoscopic models in which individual bubble co collapses are modeled, uh, order equations are solved in the conservative form, uh, a level set uh, is used uh, with a fast sweeping method from, I believe it's ZAW. Uh, a muscle Hancock scheme is implemented and jump conditions are implemented uh, using, are set using the real ghost fluid method and applied again using a fast sweeping method. So going on to a macroscopic model, these are results from Frank et al. on an axisymmetric uh, nozzle. So fl flow is induced from the top, it goes, uh, goes around the bend here, and cavitation is present at the region between 19 and 32 centimeters, millimeters. And damage occurs, I believe, centered around 23 millimeters. So to validate the model, uh, a standard uh, two-fluid mixed pressure approximation is used. A K epsilon turbulence, K epsilon SST turbulence model, and a Schneer Saver cavitation model. These are some numerical results, which are not shown, but I will show them on the video. So we can see a shedding of the vapor wave at, uh, at the center. At the bottom, you can see the target plate. And between the two lines, you can see the development of the erosion coefficient on the bottom plate. Uh, this is a simulation, I believe, for 0 0.01 a second, so only a few uh, shedding waves. Uh, but if simulation is done for enough time, we get some nice results. This is the evolution of the erosion coefficient at, at four different times using the microjet model. Uh, again, the blue lines highlight the approximate borders where cavitation erosion is seen in experimental results. Secondly, we see the evolution of the bubble collapse model. The results are quite similar. Uh, however, the microjet model predicts a larger, uh, a larger coefficient, which needs to be no normalized again. And I believe the Microsoft model has a little less scattering than the bubble collapse model. Finally, this is a comparison for radially averaged uh, uh, erosion coefficients. At the right top, you can see the development of uh, the bubble collapse model. On the bottom right, the development of the microjet model, and finally, a comparison of the two models with experimental data in red. Again, uh, green is the bubble collapse model, and blue is the microjet model, with both models showing good 
uh, agreement with experimental data. And lastly, uh, mesoscopic model is validated. Uh, here we can see two simple uh, one-dimensional uh, test, uh, tests. On the left uh, is a test of, uh, for, from Fedkev et al, I believe, yes, uh, showing a good agreement with analytical data and good convergence with increasing number of cells. And on the right uh, is a similar test with a more complex uh, initial conditions. Basically, it's uh, helium helium patch between two air patches. So the, the implementation of the ghost fluid method is quite important. And here on the left are numerical results from a bubble collapse. Again, this is a helium bubble uh, in air, which is impacted by, uh, I believe, a Mach 2 shockwave from the right to the left. Uh, the results show good agreement with uh, qualitative data from Haas et al, as seen on the right. And lastly, this is the convergence of the results with an, with an increasing cell count. Okay, oops. Uh, what is the conclusion? My scale separation is used to decouple uh, bulk fluid flow and bubble collapse. Uh, the multi-fluid formulation is valid against experimental data on bubbly columns and shows good agreement with slight issues. A macroscopic model is valid against experimental results showing good agreement for, for both models. And the mesoscopic model is uh, qualitatively uh, validated for collapse, collapsing helium bubbles in air. Future work will include the implementation of cavitation and bubble breakup and coalescence for the multi-fluid. A model validation of uh, mesoscopic models on water vapor bubble collapses in water. And lastly, and very importantly, the implementation of, Euler, uh, uh, of an Euler-Lagrange transformation just to be able to, to couple uh, the mesoscopic erosion model with the hybrid description. That's it. Thank you for your time. Uh, I'm open to your, your questions and very thankful for, to my industrial sponsor, Afton Chemicals. Thank you very much for a nice presentation. As, as far as I can see, there is no questions from the online the participants. Are there any questions from the audience in the room? I am so. Thanks for an exciting one. And I want to ask you that what is the uh, more, can you explain more details about the difference from between bubble fluid model and macro Sure. Uh, the models themselves are quite similar. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, they both they both examine all the faces on the target plate and a certain a hemisphere of cells around them. They search for the criterion of vapor, both of them. However, they have a different damage criterion. Uh, microjet, microjet models examine and look for a uh, a critical jet velocity you approximated by this expression so for a material we have a critical pressure yield stress and using basically you take this expression you put it in here and you find uh, whatever the critical pressure is to cause damage so examine is there vapor within the hemisphere and is the pressure in the va in the vapor enough to damage the surface that is the microjet model and the pressure model basically does the same thing, but it looks at the pressure itself. So very similar models. If you implement one, it's extremely easy to implement the, uh, the other one. Uh, but the core difference is then that is uh, that Frank's model considers spherical bubble collapses shown here, and Dular's model approximates approximates damage from microjets shown here, with a slight caveat that you have. A coefficient present here that you need to uh, correctly model, not co correctly model, but assume more or less. So did you put the extension for bubble or? No, but in the in the scope of uh, macroscopic models, there is no individual collapse of bubble, bubbles. So that's that's the thing I'm working on right now, and the idea is to couple. 
uh, Lagrangian bubble collapses with mesoscopic models in order to derive pressures at the surface. Uh, macroscopic models only look at the bulk flow. There is surface tension, I guess, in the mul no, there isn't in the multifluid formulation, but it can be added if needed. Uh, they only observe the bulk fluid and see if the conditions for erosion might be good. Erosion development, more accurately. Does that answer you? Thank you. Thank you. One in the chat. I will open it. Just to let you know, there are some efforts on oil regulation basis from the group of Professor M. Oakley Duisburg, in particular, Peter Ziva and Andreas Peters. I am well aware. Thank you. Uh, in fact, Peters' work was some of the motivation going into this uh, into this PhD. Uh, the idea is Peters used uh, the hybrid algorithm from from uh, the group in Chalmers, I believe. However, the algorithm, the, the bulk fluid description is monodispersed from that group. The idea is to expand that into a polydispersed formulation because a uh, significant limita limitation of that model is they assume monodispersity when they do the transformation from the Eulerian to the Lagrangian frame. So uh, thank you for that uh, tip. And the idea is to expand on that work and go into a slightly different direction. Thank you. OK, thank you. That's it. Thank you. OK, our next presenter is uh, Mr. Luca Balotinets from the University of Zagreb. So thank you. Okay, I think we're ready to go. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. So I'm happy to report that I can see some familiar faces here in the audience. But for those of you who are not here or are joining us online or don't really know me, uh, my name is Luca Balatinets, and for the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about sliding wave simulations in foam extent. So this means that I'll be talking about uh, the implementation of a wear model in form extent, and for now it's going to be uh, I'm going to talk only about dry, meaning unlubricated sliding wear. So this presentation has the following five sections, which you can see here, and uh, in the in the introduction I'm going to talk about the objectives and the motivations behind the research. Then I'm going to talk about the contact model and the wear model, and how they join together into the wear algorithm. Then we're going to look at we're going to look at some validation cases and lastly reiterate everything in the conclusion. So I always like to start with a uh, quote from an obvious tribology from its origins to Industry 4.0, which says that industrial processes have to face with ecological sustainability, climate changes, and pollution. And this shows us that there's a global shift happening towards clean and sustainable energy systems. So this is important because it shows that tribology has a uh, pivotal role in achieving greater efficiency, meaning having stringent, uh, stringent demands for lowering friction and wear in electri electrification, where uh, tribology is very important in the design of electric motors in electric vehicles, which once produced should be sealed and should require no further maintenance. And lastly, in achieving, be in achieving better lubrication, meaning uh, designing safe lubricating elements, uh, dry lubrication, and some new lubrication additives. So this means that modern tribology has to uh, face with the minimization of friction wear, with the reduction or complete elimination of any need for lubrication, uh, with the development of biodegradable or, sus or sustainable uh, coatings and lubricants, and lastly, and for us most, most importantly, with the transition towards computational modeling. So we know that experimental tests are standard practice in various industries, but we also know that they are time demanding and costly try and error based methods which require real physical models. On the other hand, uh, numerical modeling emerged as a valid and cost effective alternative to experimental methods in contact analysis. Uh, and with the advancement of computational resources, uh, greater accuracy may be achieved, meaning that numerical models uh, can be used as a viable design tool or an add-on for existing, to existing tools, which is capable of taking into account microscopic context and friction. So for us, uh, assessing lubrication, friction, and wear is very important, as we think that those are cru crucial factors in many industries, and for example, in bearing design, 
and if they're left unoptimized, they can result in lower productivity or uh, in, the, in a severe degradation of the quality of the final product. So this brings us to our research objective, which is to develop a numerical lubricated wear model, which can be used for wear analysis in numerical simulations of rotating machinery. The model is being developed uh, using the finite volume method, or more specifically using the finite area method, which is the two-dimensional counterpart to the finite volume method. We want it. We want to for it to be able. To, uh, we want to use it as a viable design tool for wear analysis of lubricated rough surfaces, meaning that it's, it needs to be able to take into account real surface roughness, meaning real surface topography. Uh, and lastly, we want uh, the model to be applicable to numerical simulations of rotating machinery, which are uh, which initially will be only small test cases, for example, pin on disk or ball on disk test cases. And then we'll move on to some larger cases with uh, machine elements from, from, for example, turbo machinery or vein pumps. So now let's talk about our wear algorithm. So the wear algorithm will be used for simulations of surface wear. So it needs to be sensitive to the uh, surface topography of real surfaces. It needs to be applicable to dry contact conditions as well as different lubrication regimes. And it needs to be able to calculate uh, wear for single or both surfaces in contact. There are pre-numerical models, which are the building blocks of the wear algorithm. And those are the asperity contact model, the lubrication model, and the wear model. The asperity contact model, together with the fluid uh, flow, uh, with the um, lubrication model, which governs the flow of the fluid, the lubricant, uh, make the lubricated contact model. Uh, the lubricated contact model, which we use as the starting point for our research, was the one that was developed and validated for simulations of wire rolling and drawing by Mr. Škuric in his, in his PhD. So for now, as mentioned, we'll be focusing for dry wear, meaning that we'll use a combination of the asperity contact model together with uh, a wear model. So we know that asperity contact models can be uh, statistical or, or deterministic. Uh, statistical contact models do not take into account asperity uh, interactions, and they're usually based on a single hemispherical asperity with a single average radius, and they assume Gaussian distribution. This tends to introduce ambiguity, uh, as, different topography, as different topographies may produce the same result. This is why, this, why we decided to use an elastic perfectly plastic contact model, uh, which is based on the procedure by Stanley Cato and Sakhan et al. Uh, this allows us to use direct measurements of surface topographies for calculating contact pressures, film thickness, area ratios, and so on. Uh, our sliding wear model uh, is based on the famous Archer wear model, which is used for uh, numerical measurements, uh, for numerical uh, simulations, as well as experimental measurements, uh, and where wear is modeled as the removal of lumps and contact areas. Also, wear is modeled as being proportional to the applied load, uh, and here, equation one allows us to uh, calculate the height of the worn vo uh, volume or wear depth for a sliding distance L. But for that, we need the, uh, for that, we need the hardness of the softer material, the dimensional wear coefficient, which can be determined experimentally for pairs of materials, and lastly, our normal contact pressure, which we can get from our contact model. Equation two, shown here, allows us to calculate the wear depth or height of the worn volume for an incremental sliding distance, uh, and, we'll be, and we'll use it in our model. So let's go through an overview of the complete wear algorithm, where the starting point are the uh, geometrical and material properties of the two surfaces in contact. Uh, then we need to resolve the initial contact between the surfaces for a predetermined load, which allows us to calculate the contact pressure, as well as the elastic and plastic deformations. Uh, on the note, uh, the contact is resolved as a contact between a deformable uh, equivalent surface and a rigid plane, and this equivalent surface carries the uh, geometrical and material properties of uh, both of the initial surfaces. Um, then, for each iteration, we can calculate the wear depth using our contact pressure from our contact model and a fixed slide increment Li and the aforementioned equation 2, which we uh, have seen in the last slide. Uh, another note is that the, uh, the wear depth we are calculating is the combined wear depth, meaning that it is being calculated for the equivalent surface. So in the next step, which is the geometry update step, uh, we will be using the uh, dimensional wear coefficient of the, two of the two surfaces in contact uh, to calculate the, um, the amount um, each, sur each surface is worn 
from the combined vert depth. So, uh, and we'll uh, update the geometries accordingly. Then we can reevaluate the contact, calculate the vert again, and update the geometries. And these three steps are repeated until total sliding distance is reached. So this allows us to use uh, the material properties for different pairs of materials to calculate the wear depth, one volume, or the, evolu or the surface evolution for single or both surfaces in contact. Now let's talk about validation. So we decided to validate our uh, wear algorithm on pin on disk sliding wear cases. Uh, we validated our results against numerical data from Rodriguez Tembleke at Altri. Here, we have a pin with a hemispherical uh, tip with a 50 millimeter, uh, 50 millimeter radius, which is sliding uh, on a disc with a, pre with a predetermined load of 10.2 Newton and with friction neglected. So we can uh, consider our point of contact sufficiently far away from the center of rotation so that uh, tangential velocity can be considered uniform. Uh, the material properties of so the pin on the, and the disc are the same and are now shown here. And next, I want to talk about the contact zone. So the contact zone between the pin and the disc due to the, due to the large curvature um, of the pin and the flatness of the disc is very small. Also, it is sufficiently far away from the center of rotation, so we can say that it is a square domain. And the length and the width of the domain are equal to two times the Hertzian contact diameter for this load. So this is about 1.2 by 1.2 millimeters. So I will talk about uh, two sets of cases next. In the first set of cases, only the pin is worn, and in the next set of cases, both the pin and the disc are worn. So here, for single surface wear, uh, only the pin is worn, as mentioned, and the disc is cons uh, considered sufficiently harder than the pin, so that any wear uh, that may happen on the disc is neglected. Uh, the dimensional wear coefficient for the pin is shown here. And the domain was initially discretized using 32 finite area faces in uh, each direction. As we wanted to be close to the data from the literature, as the authors use 30 photolateral elements in their discretization, uh, finite element discretization of the contact zone. Next, we increased the mesh uh, to have some more denser meshes. And the figures below show the uh, contact pressure evolution for different sliding distances. Uh, the data, uh, the, the full lines uh, show the data from the simulations and the broken lines, the dotted lines, are the data from the literature. We can see three mesh dens densities, as mentioned, and uh, we can say that we have very good, that we have good agreement with the data from the literature, but we may know that for larger total varying distances, so where uh, the surfaces are more severely uh, worn, uh, we have better agreement with the data from the literature. Also, for denser finite area meshes, uh, meshes it, it, it may also happen that we have a uh, uh, pressure distribution which is actually closer to the real pressure distribution, as you're using a validated uh, contact model, but more uh, elements in the contact zone. Here, we decided to continue with the 64 by 64 finite area uh, faces in our domain. And now I can show you the evolution of the surface of the pin. Again, we are saying uh, we are using the 64 by 64 front area faces digitization. Uh, again, we have different sliding distances uh, shown in different colors. The full line represents the data from the simulations, and the dotted lines are the data from the literature. Uh, and here we have excellent agreement with the data from the literature with minimal deviation. And on the right hand side, uh, we, uh, we decided to show. Um, uh, uh, so lower density and higher density mesh, but here we can see that we have minimal differences between the three mesh densities. Uh, so now we can move on to double surface wear, where both the pin and the disc are worn. Uh, the material properties of the pin and the disc are again the same and are shown here. We are using the same geometry as before and the same discretization. So now we have two, um, uh, two cases. On the left hand side, we can see a case where the dimensional wear coefficient of the pin and the disc are the same. And on the right hand side, the dimensional wear coefficient of the pin is two times larger than that of the disc. So the figures show um, the evolution of the profile of the surface of the pin and the disc. The full lines represent the data from our simulations and the uh, dots represent the data from the literature. We have the initial starting profile and then the same profile again after 500 millimeters of sliding distance. 
So on the left hand side, we can see that the pin is uh, less severely worn than on the right hand side uh, because it has a lar uh, smaller work, uh, dimensional wear coefficient. While for the disc, the situation is reversed. It's, it shows more wear on the left than on the right. Uh, in this slide, I wanted to show a visualization of the same surfaces. So again, we are looking at the figures uh, at the starting point, the starting position for both uh, figures on the left and the right are the same as this is the initial position. And then after 500 millimeters of sliding distance. So the upper surface is the pin, the lower is the disc, and we used a uh, scale factor for better visualization. So again, we can see that on the left, um, the pin is less severely worn uh, than on the right, but for the, again, for the disc, the situation is reversed. And with this, I would like to conclude the presentation. So we talked about the development and validation of a very algorithm in form extent. Uh, we, uh, we talked about the motivation of and objectives behind the very algorithm. I talked about the contact model, both dry and lubricated, and how it combines uh, with the wear model. We said that our deterministic contact model, which we are using, can take into account real surface topographies, and how our wear model is based on the famous Archer wear model. Then we went through some validation cases, which are point, uh, pin on this sliding wear cases, for single and double surface wear. And we validated the data uh, with some uh, data from uh, the literature. And lastly, I want to mention that our future work will focus on further development of the very algorithm with the main focus on using real surface scans of real uh, surfaces with the deterministic contact model and with the validation of lubricated wear cases. So thank you for your attention and please feel free to ask any questions. Thank you, Luca, for this presentation. Do we have questions from the audience? Yeah. Ah, uh, so, I was curious in the simulations we've shown, there's been the time progression of, of the wear and so on. Uh, so, this is the coefficients of wear you used were from experiment, they were from experimental results, or in this we calibrated them in the experimental results? Okay, here, uh, the dimensional wear coefficient was taken from the literature. I wanted to use the same as they did. Yeah. So, it is not based on experiment. I think it was. Uh, I'm not sure they didn't mention the source, mm. uh, but the idea later on is to use real data from experiments to use in the simulation. And basically, if you get it here, which is good, obviously, it was, it was enough to basically have constant coefficient, or did it have some sort of fine division? Uh, it was a constant coefficient. Yes. Other questions? Thank you. Uh, next and last presenter is uh, Mr. Robert uh, Anderloch from the University of Cambridge. Uh, thank you, Professor Stokovic. So, I said my name is Robert Anderloch from the University of Cambridge. I'm a PhD student uh, here under the supervision of Professor Yasak. And I'm going to present to you uh, something that is my PhD project, basically. So. The topic of, of the talk is computational modeling of the anti-wear effect of ZDP tuber films in mixed mode lubricated contact. Um, so throughout the presentation, I'm going to give you a bit of an introduction to the motivation and why we are even interested in uh, ZDP anti-wear tuber film, anti-wear models and so on. Uh, I'm going to present to you existing modeling efforts and existing models for uh, what I'm doing. And then I'm going to present to you why and how my model is different. And then lastly, as this is work in progress, I'm going to present to you the current progress and results and comment on the future work that I am aspiring to do throughout uh, the lifetime of, of my project. So uh, ZDP is a molecule whose, whose full name I'm not going to try to pronounce. Uh, so basically, it is the most commonly used anti-wear additive. So what it basically is, is a, is a chemical you put into lubricating oils. It, uh, when, when sliding surfaces, uh, most usually we are interested in steel. When they come into contact, uh, protective tuber films are formed on top of uh, sliding surfaces. So in the left figure here, you see a visualization of how they form sort of padded structures and going for the, from the substrate, which is usually steel, or we are mostly interested in steel, they uh, they somewhat change in structure, going to the to the top, and the middle part is basically glassy uh, polyphosphates. They're they're even transparent to that. And on the on the right side, you see 
an actual scan of, of, uh, of an actual surface. So basically, this is about 100, uh, 100 micrometers uh, scale. And basically, here we can see that the films, uh, the films are of uh, the order of 100 to 150 to 100 nanometers uh, thickness. Um, so the me uh, mechanisms through which they protect uh, surfaces from wear, uh, the number one most significant one and one that I'm modeling is mechanical protection. So basically, by their existence prevents uh, mechanical contact of two rubbing surfaces or even more of them. Uh, and basically, instead of the substrate uh, being worn out as a as a consequence of the of the of the contact, the tribe films are getting worn out and then replenished. Uh, uh, when that point comes into contact with the oil containing, uh, containing the uh, additives. And then another uh, form of protection is corrosion prevention, and then another one is abrasion prevention, because those ribofilms also react with hard and abrasive iron oxide particles, which would be in the lubricant, which would otherwise abrade the surface. Um, so something about the history of usage of ZDPs. So interestingly, they are a very good example of why and, and how tribology as a field is uh, somewhat difficult to research. Um, you, you'll see why. So basically, they were first used in mid 20th century as a, as a corrosion inhibitor. So that behavior was first discovered. And then statistically, basically, the mechanical antiwear function was recognized in about 1955. Uh, and their usage was uh, completely fine. But in 1990s, exhaust after treatment catalysts were introduced into internal combustion engines as a, as a technology. And the problem is that uh, phosphorus oxides that uh, come to life as a, as a side effect of ZDP tube films, uh, they reduce the effectiveness of, of um, exhaust catalysts. And for that reason, ZDP is considered environmentally unfriendly. However, so far, no satisfying alternative has been found. So we're talking about uh, something that's cheap enough and effective enough, uh, and so on. Um, regarding the history of research, so this part is interesting because um, as a lot of things in tribology, it is, it is very difficult to experimentally observe. As for example, if you're trying to observe that, you can't simply take it out of contact because then you're changing the chemistry of, of the contact you're exposing it to air, and so on. So basically, since it was first used, discovered and first used, um, the uh, analytical and experimental methods in the last 50 to 70 years have progressed. And so has the understanding of the mechanisms, our understanding of the mechanism th through which ZDP protects surfaces, such as microscopy, for example, to be able to even see uh, how the roughnesses, how the surfaces look when you put them under, a, obviously, microscope. And then spectro spectroscopy, for example, to realize what are the uh, chemical um, um, components that the surface, surfaces are made of, or nano indentation to uh, measure uh, experimentally uh, hardness or elastic modulus of surfaces and, and so on. So this was not easy to do, let's say, 50 years ago. Um, and for motivation of this work, so obviously we are engineers. We like to predict stuff if we can. Uh, so uh, to have a predictive model, of how this works would be nice uh, to help with component design. Uh, and also, since ZDP is considered somewhat or quite environmentally unfriendly, uh, we would like to figure out or, or yeah, figure out how ZDP actually works as, as well as we can. So we can possibly hope to uh, find something else that can have similar properties as, as a chemical, but maybe not be as un environmentally unfriendly. Uh, so again, similar to same as Tran, I'm funded by uh, Upton Chemical, and uh, big thanks for to, to them for funding our our, uh, our work. Uh, so uh, to discuss existing models that are trying to do the same thing. So the main differences uh, in between those models and my model are usually found in the four different parts of the solution loop. So basically, this is a, this is obviously a simplified simplified uh, um, scheme schematic of, of the solution loop. So basically, we have a contact mechanism model, which uh, which resolves uh, what is going on with a contact. So it could be uh, lubricated, unlubricated, and this and that, and so on. So basically, after we have those components, of which the, the important parameters are temperatures, pressures, uh, shear stresses, and so on, and they affect the tube film growth and removal and wear and so on, uh, we can use the outputs of this, of this aspect of the model to calculate uh, 
growth and removal of the tuber films as shown in those initial images when you, when you saw the tuber films of 100 to 100 nanometers. And then using this information, this specific information for these models, we can try to calculate and numerically simulate the wear. So this is actually the thing that we are mostly, interesting, mostly interested in, uh, the wear of the actual steel substrate. And uh, lastly, uh, we also definitely want to calculate, be able to calculate new surface properties as the simulation is progressing throughout uh, time steps. And basically this is then used within uh, the quantum mechanics model because hardnesses can change, elastic modules can change, and so on. Um, so basically first I'm going to comment on how some existing models uh, handles, handle, handle these issues, and then I'm going to show how my model differs. Uh, so for contact mechanics, uh, basically some of the models that have tried to model ZDP so far have not used anything in, in this regard. So some of them even use contact pressures, uh, let's say analytical solutions to the Hertz pressure, which, which basically gives you, if you have a, a spherical contact on a, on a, on a plane, it uh, gives you the distribution of, uh, of pressure, then sometimes people use the maximum pressure in the contact of the average and, and so on. So that's a very simplified a way to approach this. Uh, the most popular way is uh, uh, to use the Bucinas solution. So this is basically quite similar to what Luca was explaining. And this is all something that I'm using. I'll come to that again. Uh, with uh, elastic, um, elastic ideal, ideally plastic models and FFT is used to accelerate the solution. So basically this gives us a mechanism to calculate these distributions of contact pressures uh, and so on. Um, most models uh, that try to tackle ZDP uh, anti wear tuber films uh, so far neglected the hydrodynamical effects of the lubricant. And so far, the one and only one was from Azam in 2018 that solved the Reynolds equation for the lubricant while modeling ZDP uh, tuber films. And uh, lastly, regarding contact mechanics, uh, temperature in studying contact is somewhat interesting in, in tribology because it's usually considered as a sum of the bulk temperature and flash temperature. So, the bulk temperature, if you have a Let's imagine you have a peanut disk test, test as Luca was showing just now. Uh, so we would have an, usually an oil in there, or we would measure the bulk temperature of um, of the disk, for example, at, at a, some 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 point which is further away from the actual contact, and then we would assume that that is the bulk sort of uh, temperature that's present almost everywhere in the domain. And then the flash temperature would be at the temperature that is present uh, in a very short time scale. And the uh, and the space scale as well, so like very very locally. So basically, you you get the uh, friction induced temperature increase, but that soon soon uh, very soon uh, dissipates, and then again that point of contact as the uh, sliding uh, motion goes away. Let's say uh, that again goes to bulk tem uh, bulk temperature. Uh, so so far, most models use an assumption of a constant te temperature uh, within uh, the the contact. Uh, basically, how they approach this is they say, okay, we are we have measured uh, what's going on in some sort of experiment, and they they measure that uh, the temperature is 100 Celsius for their experiment, and then they use some analytical uh, analytical expressions to calculate that. Uh, okay, so the maximum increase of temperature in their contact in their case is let's say half a Celsius. So they say we don't care; it's 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 fine. Uh, they're just going to use the bulk temperature. Um, so that was it regarding contact mechanics models that were used previously, uh, regarding tuber film growth and removal models. So the first person to tackle this issue, the ZDP modeling in general, was Anderson, to my knowledge, was Anderson in 2012. And this is a, a model that he used to, to uh, model tuber film growth and removal. And it, both growth and removal are summed up in, in one equation. So basically using this uh, negative feedback of sorts, uh, He's limiting the maximum value of, of H in this case. Um, yeah, so it's a, a, but here I want to emphasize that uh, from the contact mechanics model, P or contact pressure is, uh, is used. Uh, Goswami in 2015, uh, he, he was the first one to propose what is known as SETA model or stress augmented thermally activated model that basically says that it's quite similar to an Arrhenius equation. Uh, it postulates that uh, the growth of the film is uh, exponentially proportional uh, in some ways uh, to uh, the contact pressure present in the contact uh, and to the temperature also present in the sliding contact. And then Zhang and Spikes in 2016 made an 
uh, sort of an appendix to, to that theory, saying that actually this uh, this model is correct, but actually pressure is not the driving force, but it is instead the shear stress. And uh, they made that um, through experiments uh, with without any contact, but still with shear stress. So it was a fully lubricated film, where obviously you have shear, shear stress, but no contact uh, pressure. Uh, then in 2015, Ganbar Zadeh, uh, he used a uh, model for tuber film grown to removal, which had temperature as a parameter present, but uh, and it gave pretty good results. But the thing is that uh, it used time. So basically, a lot of these parameters are calibration parameters without a big um, a big predictive value. Uh, so basically, he calibrated a somewhat arbitrary model without with limited physical meaning to accurately model uh, experiments. And then actually in 2015, uh, 17, again, used the SETA model. And then he had a separate way to model the removal of the tuber film. So now within one time step, he would say, OK, I have a separate growth and removal that are happening at, at the same time. And the removal would, was modeled using a linear uh, correlation uh, with, with the constant uh, alpha, uh, which was a coefficient. Uh, and he, he would multiply that with the current tuber film thickness locally to get the removal of the tuber film at that point. So uh, this is still quite not predictive in a way. Uh, and Azam in 2018 used this, the same model uh, as Ganbar in 2015. And in 2021, uh, we had Chen Gu Tian, who used also the SETA model for growth. And then interestingly, for removal of the tuber film, they used Archer's Law. So same as presented by Luca, where we have uh, the sliding velocity and uh, dimensional square coefficient, contact pressure, and hardness of the surface. And uh, they modeled the contact, uh, sorry, the wear coefficient as linearly dependent on the local uh, tuber film thickness. Uh, so, okay, after we have the tuber film growth and removal, how do we approach modeling uh, substrate wear when we have that data, that information? Uh, so, in 2015, Ganber Zadeh, he said that, uh, okay, we, he's, he was using Archer's law, and the way he was modeling, the way he was using the information about the tuber film was that he had a, a linearly dependent, dependent wear coefficient, dimensionless wear coefficient that he was getting from uh, the local thickness of the tuber film, as shown in this image. Uh, Akchurin, 2017, uh, the, way, the way he simulated the surface wear was by saying, OK, if you remember from a couple of slides before, he had this removal term for the actual tuber film that was forming on top of uh, the substrate. And then when he had that, he would multiply that with an assumed distribution of the uh, concentration of the substrate throughout the thickness of the film. So basically, when you are at the bottom uh, of the root of the tuber film, you will have pure steel. And then the assumption is that it's in a way diffuses throughout the tuber film and uh, exponentially dimin diminishes uh, towards the surface of the film. Uh, and then using that and the pre calculated uh, removal rate of the tuber film on top, he would get the removal rate of the substrate or uh, steel. And then Chen Gutian in 2021 used the same uh, idea. And regarding surface mechanical properties, so we are most interested in hardness and elastic modulus. Uh, so this is a measurement by the mole from 2006, which show, uh, so basically the more tuber film, the more, the thicker the tuber film is, the softer it is, so the lower the hardness and the elastic modulus is also lower. Uh, this seems contradictory to this, but this is a measurement with, uh, this is a nano indentation result where with uh, increasing plastic deformation, you would get a higher uh, hardness and a higher elastic module. So you can also imagine it reversed. Um, there, was a, there was an algorithm by Anderson in 2012 that assumed a linear variation of hardness. It was also used by some other authors uh, in some of the papers that I have mentioned previously. Um, uh, and that was used to that was used to calculate the change of hardness as as you get plastic deformation of the film. Uh, regarding Young's modulus, uh, it is, was usually considered constant most often, and then some authors considered it uniform. But it would change throughout the course of the simulation with the time step. So basically, for each time step, you go over the whole simulation domain, uh, and average 
and take the average of the, the elastic modulus in, in, in the domain. And Acturian also used a layered contact mechanics model. Um, so to comment again, so my model, uh, sorry, uh, I'm going to present how my model differs and in these four main key points. So to repeat, contact mechanics model, tribal film growth and removal, substrate wear, and calculating the new surface properties, mainly hardness and elastic modulus. Uh, so for contact mechanics model, I am using a mixed mode lubricated, lubricated contact model by Shkurich from 2019. Uh, to repeat, solid mechanics, uh, I'm using the, I'm solving the Bucinesque solution, uh, elastic, perfectly plastic, using FFT to accelerate the solution. Uh, regarding lubrication, it, it is using, we are, we are using the Reynolds equation with support for cavitation. And regarding temperatures, there is a lubricated energy equation together with a moving heat source to basically uh, capture both the temperatures of the surfaces and the lubricant and, and so on. Regarding the tuberculin growth and removal, so this has been used by, by other authors, and I think uh, given the uh, state of the art of ex experiments, this is a good uh, assumption, a good approximation for how tuberculins grow. Uh, Archer's Wear Law uh, is, is a good way to model, uh, is a good way to model um, the removal of the tuberculin. And then from there, similar to approach uh, by Turing, we can use that to get uh, the removal of the substrate, which would be present in a certain concentration throughout the thickness of the tuber film. Uh, and regarding hardness, uh, so I assumed a linear uh, variation similar to what, what was seen in those measurements, and the same for uh, the Young's elastic modulus. And I'm using a spatially uniform but uh, temporally variable uh, elastic modulus in my simulations. I implemented the novel procedure based on the one by Anderson 2012, as, as mentioned before, but basically I am able to iteratively calculate. Uh, so he, basically his model only works if you have a linear uh, variation of hardness, which I still am using, but I'm considering uh, switching to, to a different one. And basically my mine is generalized and I basically implemented a uh, iterative procedure to calculate plastically deformed uh, surface properties such as hardness and uh, elastic uh, modulus. Um, regarding, okay, wh what do you do? So basically, the contact mechanics model solves for a stationary model, but the thing is that your domain is actually moving around. Uh, so Anderson in 2011 uh, implemented a, a procedure where he would he had a ball on ball on a flat plate uh, experiment where he would calculate the uh, contact mechanics aspect, so solid contact, and then he would basically smear it out over the actual uh, movement part of the ball on the disc, and that was successfully used to model purely the wear uh, of on the on the plate. And I'm doing something similar, uh, although slightly different, because because of the ex um, exponential nature of the dependence of tuber film growth, it is not as simple as that. Because uh, basically, what I'm doing is I am using the co uh, contact pressure. So here you see an example of a rough uh, rough surface simulation and a resulting contact pressure. And then from that, I would calculate, let's say, if I'm interested in the wear depth in a, in, a given, in a given time step, I calculate it as if it was stationary, and then I calculate that to, to smear it over. It would be fine if I first calculate, if I smear the contact pressure, and then from that calculate the wear depth, it would still be fine, but I would have problems with zero film growth because it should be exponential, and in that case, it would not be tested. Uh, so basically, to reiterate, uh, I have... I'm going to use a, I'm using a contact mechanics model that is uh, in several aspects better than anyone else has used before in ZDP modeling. Uh, regarding tuberful ground and removal, I'm using a combination of previously used stuff, uh, but basically I'm using models that have shown to, that were shown to give the best um, uh, behavior. And the same for substrate wear. And then I have also implemented some new ways to calculate uh, surface uh, properties. Uh, so to give some current progress and results, so this is work in progress. Uh, so to validate, uh, I used experimental set of uh, experimental results by Gambarzadek 2015. So it, it is a ball on disc experiment where they measure tuber film thickness on top of the uh, rotating ball. So basically, this is a microscope uh, measuring the, the thickness, and then they also measured. Basically, they repeated the experiments several times, let's say three times, and then after after 
the first one was lasting for 30 minutes, and then they removed uh, the, the contact. They would put the ball out of contact, and then they would, they, they would measure the wear on the disc. They did the same after 45 minutes, and then they, they did the same after two, two hours with three different experiments. As, and that's how we get the progression of the wear on the disc, but at the same time, we can continuously measure the uh, growth of the uh, tuber film on the ball. These are some general uh, parameters for, uh, for the uh, experiments. Uh, so basically, so far, th this one is interesting. So this is a very low lambda ratio, which, which means it is boundary li lubrication. So, so far, I'm not modeling hydrodynamic lubrication, but it's, it's, it is easy to include that uh, given uh, experimental data that require it. Uh, this is a visual, visual, visualization of my simulation domain. And from Gomar uh, Zadeh, from his experiments, uh, 100 Celsius experiments are recreated. And I hope this is going to work. It surprisingly is going to work. Oh, less, not so surprising after all. Uh, so give me a second. Hopefully it would work with. Ah, yeah, so basically we see the evolution of Gamar Zadek, of trying to recreate uh, Gamar Zadek's experiments. And basically on the left, it's, uh, the font might be a bit small, but on the left we see the development of the tribal film on top of the ball. Um, so basically, yeah, you see that it reaches about 180 nanometers of, of thickness. I'm stagnant is there. Uh, here we see basically this gap, this little gap. So this is visualized with a different... Uh, scale so that's why obviously this and this does not completely correlate visually uh, but uh, this is this is the gap in between surfaces or the tribal film that is basically forming in between the two steel substrates two steel surfaces and then this is a vis visualization of the disc wear that uh, occurs uh, as a as as a as a side effect of the contact as an effect of the contact um yeah so to quantify this a bit I'm getting close to the end, don't worry. To quantify this a bit, uh, uh, these are my results of the, film, of the ball tuberfilm thickness. So I'm getting quite good sort of stationary steady state results, but I still have some work to do with modeling this. And um, I will comment on that on my future work. I do have uh, ways, ways through which I hope I'm going to correct this. Uh, this square is uh, not too bad, if I might say. Uh, it's, uh, so basically, the red dots were, as I, as I mentioned, so basically the results they would get uh, by measuring the surface of the, uh, by scanning the surface of the disk after removing, after removing the surfaces out of the contact after 30 minutes, 45 minutes, and two hours. And this is the profile, uh, the wear profile after a to our experiment from my simulation and from their experiment. And uh, you might notice something here. So basically, obviously, they have a, an actual rough surface. Uh, this is not very rough, by the way. This is a almost perfectly smooth surface. I mean, especially the, the sides. But I do have, so regarding future work, I do, so one of them is to expand and improve rough surface, surface handling. I'm able to uh, model rough surfaces, sur surfaces, but I do have some ways, basically, I couldn't fit it I couldn't fit to talk about it in a 20 minute presentation anymore, but I have some ways to which maybe to improve the smearing procedure that I described and so on. Um, of course, I need to validate against more experimental results, which do exist in, in literature and uh, in all of those, because that is a strength of my model as compared to other ZNP models. Uh, I want to focus on mixed model lubrication, so hydrodynamically lubricated uh, cases. Uh, and I definitely want to improve on variable elasticity, elasticity treatment. So this, I think this one will, will be, will make a big difference, especially in this, in this case, uh, because that is a big aspect of how ZDP actually works. I probably should have mentioned that earlier, but one of the big theories is that the reducing of that, of that elastic modulus is what actually makes it a cushion on top of steel surfaces and reduces the contact pressures, which, which ultimately reduces the, uh, wear. Uh, and uh, that is, those are some of my sort of uh, hard goals. And after that, uh, I want to basically use a complete model, hopefully, to explore modeling of various scenarios. Uh, 
uh, de depletion of ZDP in, in, in oil, which would be used in you know, several hour experiments and so on. And then there are some mentions of diamond nanoparticles. There are some papers that uh, basically have some ways of, of improving of performance and modifying performance of ZDP tuberfilms and, uh, and so on. But basically the first four points are something that I am devoted to uh, working on the most. And the last one is, uh, would be the cherry on top. Uh, yeah. And thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'll be. Thank you, thank you Robert, for my presentation. Do we have questions from movement? That's right. There is no question. I have one question related to energy integration. Okay. You mentioned that we have energy integration in lubricant, which is, I suppose, a surface. Yes, yes. So it's a. Uh, Sure, uh, mentioned you, Professor Tukovic. This is exactly using the finite area at, at, area uh, method formulation. So it's a, it's a two D equation, uh, basically. Do you have also an equation with solid particles? Uh, so that is, um, I would say, that is more of a zero D equation. More of a, so basically, there is a there is a there is an equation that uh, calculates the flash temperature of the surfaces and then that is used as, as boundary conditions for the energy equation of the, of the, of the lubricant. So yes, but it, it is not a cons conservation equation that so is used in open. Yes, 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 definitely, definitely, okay. definitely. Okay, so if you, if you want to have additional questions, we can do this presentation and I suppose we can conclude this session and thank you very much to thank the you. presenters, to the audience and uh, good luck and good night.